My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. If our present situation seems crazy to you, you're in good company. We often hear the word unprecedented used to describe the COVID pandemic, the resultant economic fallout, the egregious murder of George Floyd, and the recognition that racism and racial violence are still very much a part of our culture. Demonstrations and protests fraught with anger and responded to in anger. Leadership that falls short of owning the title and overt anger, fear, and uncertainty. Is there a way that we may look to spirituality and spiritual practice for direction, clarity, calming, and peace? Is there a spiritual practice for crazy times? Returning to Destination Unlimited this week is Philip Goldberg. Philip Goldberg has been studying the world's spiritual traditions for more than 45 years. He's the author or co-author of some 25 books published in more than a dozen languages. His book, American Veda, was named by Huffington Post and Library Journal as one of the top 10 religion books of 2010. It was followed in 2018 by the popular biography, The Life of Yogananda. He blogs on spirituality and health and co-hosts the Spirit Matters podcast. His website is philipgoldberg.com, and he joins me this week to discuss his new book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, Powerful Tools to Create Calm, Clarity, and Courage. Please join me in welcoming back to Destination Unlimited, Philip Goldberg. Welcome, Phil. Hey, Victor. Good to be with you again. And great to have you back. Thank you, and congratulations for this wonderful and timely new book. Um, <laughs> you were last on with me in 2018 discussing your biography on the life of Yogananda, and at the mm -hmm. time I kidded about the fact that we were two boys from Brooklyn talking about <laughs> Eastern spirituality. For listeners, well, here we go again. Here we go again. For listeners meeting you for the first time, please share your early path and how it led to your calling. Ah, well, as you suggested, I, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Brooklyn, like you, before it was uh, hip and fashionable, uh, but always, you know, this great melting pot of uh, creativity and uh, immigrant uh, development. And then the 60s came, and I uh, was in the spirit of that era, uh, searching for truth and meaning and purpose and uh, how to be happy and how to live a fulfilled life uh, as everything around me uh, seemed. Uh, I didn't fit very well. And uh, I was a political activist, you know, in civil rights and the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, but in my personal life, Having, you know, I was raised by atheists and I hadn't, there was no religion. I had no use for a conventional religion. And then all the other institutions and uh, mainstream uh, sources of guidance uh, seemed to falter. Um, and, and in that context of the sort of counterculture, books on Indians and uh, Eastern spirituality in general, what we think of as Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, but the the spirit of global mystical uh, insight and uh, the practical uh, methods of turning within that came out of the yoga uh, tradition uh, appealed to me a great deal. They, they seemed to answer a lot of my questions, and they proposed ways of improving from the inside out uh, that did not require my believing in things I couldn't believe in or necessarily you know, signing on to a belief system or uh, faith. Uh, and so I explored and 
took up meditation practices, became a meditation teacher, and the, that era of the late 60s uh, was transforming. And so I've been a student of uh, the world. I expanded my, my range, you know, and I became a student of all the world's spirituality. And, and in my professional life as a writer, uh, had opportunity to uh, explore it even further, especially in the last uh, 10 years or so. And that brings us to a spiritual practice for crazy times, which I wrote last year before we knew how crazy the times would be when it was published. Absolutely. You incarnated into this lifetime about eight years before I did, so we have a common memory of what unfolded in the 60s and 70s. Our generation was one of hope, of change, of social and political activism, and also of compassion and love. In your view, how did we go from that to what has developed over the last few uh, years? Is this a teachable moment for us? I hope so. It certainly has the opportunity to be a teachable moment, and I hope people take it as such. And certainly uh, people I know are, in fact, doing that. How it happened, I mean, I you know, I have to confess I was an idealist in those days, and we thought we were changing the world for the better, and in many ways we did. And when I turned essentially from political activism to spiritual activism, thinking, you know, the real way to change the world is from the inside out by, uh, you know, changing people's uh, consciousness and using the methods of uh, meditation and yoga and other uh, spiritual practices to uh, develop the minds and hearts of each individual that the world would change more profoundly. And what I came to realize is that uh, we need both. We need to pay attention to the inner life of uh, people on an individual basis, and we also need to pay careful attention to uh, what's going on and take our roles as citizens very uh, seriously as well. Um, how this happened, how this degenerated, because, you know, we did, there were a lot of changes, you know, uh, as bad as um, things are uh, racial in our racial relations, they're certainly better than they were in the early and mid 60s, you know, when uh, civil rights laws were written and so forth. And I mean, I remember growing up uh, in even in a mixed neighborhood like Brooklyn, you know, to see a mixed race couple was, a, you know, people were mocked and jeered for that uh, in, even when I was growing up. And now, you know, things are very different. But at the same time, uh, things haven't changed enough and things in some ways have degenerated. I hope this turns out to be uh, the last gasp of um, racism and uh, other forms of social ills that uh, keep us down. Absolutely. You had mentioned that you started writing this book last year, and then you added some stuff because of COVID. Historically, there have been pandemics before. The world recovered and moved on. What is different about this one? Well, for one thing, the medium we're on now uh, social media is different. I was, you know, reading some stuff about the uh, what was called the Spanish flu epidemic or pandemic, almost exactly a hundred years ago, and I th I was thinking about what it must have been like without television, without uh, radio, even without, uh, let alone the internet and the ability to communicate information quickly and uh, as developments happen. That's a huge difference. I think we have a better educated population. Uh, for the most part, we have a healthier population, although it could be argued that, you know, they ate better and more naturally back, back then before all the processed food and, 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 and before the air was as polluted as it is now. Um, but um, I also think you know, to, to bring it back to my book, we have now access to more information to help us cope 
and help us uh, use this time uh, for those of us who are blessed enough to to be able to uh, to develop our uh, spiritually to learn the lessons from it as you said earlier you know this can be a, a major teaching moment uh, both individually and collectively so I think there's many ways in in which this is this is different from what uh, previous health crises were but uh, at the same time it is just as complicated and just as dangerous if not more so because of um, the ease of transportation I mean this spread so quickly and so rapidly because of uh, the same tech the technology, the same communication and uh, transportation technologies that are making it better, easier to cope with. <laughs> it's, so it's a, these things are mixed blessings, aren't they? Absolutely. What would you say or how would you address those who make the decision not to follow the protocol, not to wear the mask or uh. the procedures? Go ahead. It disturbs me, you know, a tremendous amount. I mean, I'm, you know, this book is about taking a spiritual approach to uh, crises and uh, difficult times. And, and, and as you said, it was written before the pandemic. But really, Victor, all I added, uh, because there was no time uh, at the very latest stages of proofreading and all that, all I did was add a short paragraph about the uh, COVID crisis, and because I, I realized that everything in the book will apply, I wanted it to be timeless. So, you know, the the advice and information in the book will apply even in the best of times if you're going through, you know, a difficult period in your personal life. Um, but to 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 answer your question, um, it disturbs me a great deal that uh, people would not be willing to make really a trivial and minor sacrifice to put on a mask when they're out in public. I just went food shopping this morning. So I wore a mask for maybe 20 minutes. It was not a burden. It was, you know, fine. It was easy. I, I don't understand why people would would defy that and put other people at risk, not to mention themselves and their loved ones, in the name of some illusory freedom when they have no problem driving on the right side of the road or putting on safety belts or not smoking in an in a indoor setting. We have rules and uh, guidelines for the public good. Uh, so I don't understand it. It's a it's a distorted sort of sense of you know don't tread on me that is 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 rather dangerous. I think you know true freedom comes from within, and I felt uh, no I interference with my freedom when I take a walk with my wife and we put on masks or I go food shopping like I did this morning. In fact, I think it's an assertion of my freedom to participate in making you know the environment safer not to mention the fact that from just from a personal moral standpoint i know by doing this that i'm not only protecting those around me but protecting my family my personal situation um where do you think just just a speculation where do you think or, or your observation where do you think this generational, because it seems like a lot of young folks are, are ignoring the mask yeah. rules. Where do you think this came from? That's a good question. I think young people always feel invulnerable. I know I did. I mean, look, you know, we were talking about the 60s. Did I take seriously the uh, advice of my elders that the drugs I was experimenting with might have been dangerous? Did I care about hitchhiking and the possible dangers of that? You know, young people, you know, always uh, have that uh, feeling of uh, the bravery and but I think it was uh, amplified in this case by the erroneous uh, suggestion that young people are somehow not vulnerable to this virus because the early indications were that, were that very young people, don't, you know, when they get it, don't have the 
the uh, same uh, level of uh, pathological symptoms that older people did. And that may be true, but they could still transmit it to others. And people in their 20s and 30s are not the same as people who are 8 or 10 years old. And uh, they're carriers, and they're in hospitals now, too. So this sense of invulnerability and the sense of don't have these these uh, grown-ups, these uh, fastidious, <laughs> conservative grown-ups tell us we can't go to bars and party. You know, it's a very immature way to be young, but seems to be prevalent. And I wonder if the fact that certain leadership also failed to wear the protective masks sent out the wrong message. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we can't deny that. It's not only that they failed to wear the masks and model appropriate behavior. They were actively uh, suggesting it's an individual choice and it's, hey, no big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, certain p the people in power even... Uh, you know, refused to put in regulations that would mandate that people follow safety procedures. It's, it, there's a kind of libertarian, leave us alone uh, strain in uh, the American zeitgeist lately that, you know, I understand where it's coming from, but it's, it could be very dangerous when it's taken to this kind of extreme. You know, we have a lot of politicians I'll try not to name names, but it should be obvious that, uh, you know, are putting their election chances ahead of public safety. It, it, we have to acknowledge that. Absolutely. So I guess I ask you now, how do we find balance in the era of COVID-19? Well, you know, as, I, as I, I've said a couple of times, I wrote Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times early. I started writing it early 2019 or in the spring. Um, because times were crazy then. And, and, you know, I had a lot of people struggling with, you know, the political and social atmosphere of the era. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, I've learned a lot over my years, and um, there's a lot of great guidance, so maybe I should uh, put it in a book form. And I discussed it with my publisher, Hay House, and we said, let's go for it. And when I, you know, I wrote it uh, in the matter of five or six months last year, and we slated it for publication this August, right now, and uh, thinking, well, times were crazy when I wrote it, and times will be crazier uh, in 2020 leading up to the election. And then came January and February. I was in India when the uh, COVID, uh, when the crisis hit in in uh, China and started to spread it I, I was on my way back from India when you know Italy shut down and I came back and proofread the book and we we thought should we change it and we thought no the the advice applies but we when March or April hit and we were all in lockdown the publisher and I brought out the uh digital version, the ebook, the Kindle and so forth version, uh, early, because that, that, that could be done technologically, and, and, and made it available for $1.99. So in a sense, the book's been available for a few months, even though the, the paper version is now uh, coming out, you know, because we couldn't change the date of that. So the whole point of the book, if I have to summarize it in one uh, sentence, uh, or one concept, it's that all the world's spiritual teachings have told us for thousands of years, and still do, that we, each of us, has within us what I call an inner sanctuary and a fortress of strength. It's our innermost being. At our core, we have perfect peace. We have contentment. We have awakened uh, knowledge and uh, consciousness. And the degree to which we can access that and infuse its qualities into our lives, we have uh, the opportunity to maintain inner calm, to have refuge within ourselves, regardless of what's going on around us. 
but I make a, an important point, and most of the book is about how to get access to that inner sanctuary, how to find inner peace in the midst of circumstances and cultivate it and make it part of your life. But it's also, it's, it's not an escape. And I make a strong point of that, and I want to emphasize it here because, you know, of all the things we've talked about already, this is a, a crisis period. And it means we all have to take responsibility as citizens. And access to this inner sanctuary is also a platform for more effective action. Absolutely. My guest is Philip Goldberg. He's the author of the new book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. We'll be back with more Phil after these words on the Olden Times Radio Network. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. America, your children have an amazing superpower. That's right. They can help save lives by simply washing their hands. Just 20 seconds of thorough hand washing after they've coughed or sneezed or been outside can help fight against the dastardly spread of germs. Armed with only soap and water and hands, your superhero can protect you, your family, and everyone out there in America land. Amazing. Find out more at coronavirus.gov. A message from the CDC and the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. So I'm a cat. And I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. On Destination Unlimited, my guest this work, Philip Goldberg, the author of the new book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. Phil, you wrote an amazing essay entitled Spiritual Responsibility in the Age of Black Lives Matter. To quote a line from that essay, you said, Our long overdue moment of reckoning is a spiritual challenge, not just a social or a political one. We're called upon to stretch beyond our comfort zones, to introspect rigorously and self-assess honestly. What do we as a society and spiritually centered people in particular need to do? As that passage suggests, uh, a time of introspection for each of us. I was I was moved to write that, uh, and it's on uh, my blog on spirituality and health online because you know I've been an anti-racist you know for, from childhood. I was raised by you know anti-racist, anti-bigotry uh, New York liberals, and 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 I I grew up with you know Jackie Robinson as a family hero and. Um, uh, my my mother having African American friends and uh, going to an integrated uh, schools and having black playmates and teammates and all that. So and then I was a, a civil rights you know activist in college and so I always thought of myself as not having 
to uh, learn much about, you know, racism. And I always, I mean, we, we didn't call it structural racism when I was in college, but we knew that you know, racism was a institutionally supported and, and, and um, propagated. But when Black Lives Matter uh, came into prominence and the term white privilege came, I was moved by uh, a couple of black friends to uh, look at it myself. And I thought, my God, even I have a lot to learn, despite all my background and upbringing. I have a lot to learn as well. So imagine people who didn't have the, an in, you know, grow up in an integrated neighborhood, may never have known black people when they were young. Uh, we all have a lot to learn. And, and I call it a spiritual crisis because, to me, spirituality is about uh, individual transformation and opening our hearts and recognizing our uh, common humanity and our interrelatedness. And, and if, if we don't get that we're all connected uh, in the midst of a worldwide crisis of infectious disease will never i mean it, it nothing could be more obvious than how interconnected we are and how the the uh the quality of life of one person or one group affects everybody else if we can't become spiritually more generous less greedy, less self-centered. These are all spiritual qualities, compassion and empathy. Um, this is an opportunity for us to develop those qualities in ourselves. We're being called to do that. And um, it not only is a, a, a social necessity, but it's good for us individually, being more compassionate, being more empathetic, uh, being less materialistic, less selfish, uh, makes us happier, makes us more content, makes us uh, feel better about ourselves, makes us better parents, makes us better neighbors, better citizens. Um, it makes the world a, a, a nicer place to be in. So I see this as, um, you know, as much a spiritual a crisis and a, a, a spiritual necessity as it is a, a social or political one. Absolutely. Uh, I grew up in, uh, you're familiar probably with Borough Park in Brooklyn. Yes. And uh, my neighborhood when I grew up was primarily uh, Jewish people, uh, Eastern European Jews, uh, uh, Italian folks, uh, some Irish folks. Right. Uh, and, and in the early 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, the... Uh, city had passed laws where that folks or, or black children from other neighborhoods would be uh, bust into our neighborhood mm. uh, and and uh, when I didn't know the difference between a person with, uh, I mean, other than the color of their skin, I didn't see them any differently. I was raised in a home where we were taught to love everyone and respect everyone and I made friends instantly with a lot of these kids mm -hmm. and uh, because I did, uh, my uh, friends uh, started dis my white friends started disowning me really and wow. uh, some of their parents actually said stay away from the n-word lover re referring to me Jeez. and it was very traumatic for me i didn't understand why this was happening i had no concept as to why my friendship with black children had any effect on my friendship with anybody else it just it did not make sense to me in my heart and it was very painful and hurtful and not that i'll ever understand what it's like to be african-american to be black i'll never understand that because ha not having that right. skin color i've never been exposed to that type of thing but i have a taste for that and, and a great compassion and a great sympathy and a great empathy and a great desire to embrace everyone so perhaps it was a a hard lesson but a good lesson Yes, and I had a similar, uh, I grew up in a similar neighborhood with the one exception being that we were close enough to a black enclave so that um, our school and the buses and subways were much more integrated than it sounds like yours was. Mm -hmm. And so from kindergarten on, I had black classmates and I was a, an athletic kid. 
And, uh, you know, and my father would take me to see the Dodgers play and we would, you know, root for Jackie Robinson and the, the stands were all integrated. And so, uh, and, and my mother was, you know, uh, she campaigned to have a black friend of hers be president of the PTA when I was in the sixth grade. Mm. And what I never understood, and you experienced it as well, we both grew up uh, around first, second, third generation immigrants and, um, you know, with immigrant backgrounds, Jews and, and Italian and Irish Catholics, all of whom were discriminated against in earlier generations. And you would think that that heritage would immunize you from being bigoted yourself, yeah. but it didn't always play that way. And that was always shocking to me and uh, still is, frankly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. No answer. I, I don't have the answer. And perhaps uh, in, in our wisdom, in retrospect, in the next lifetime, uh, we will <laughs> have changed, I hope. Um, I briefly mentioned our respective activism back in the 60s and 70s. I remember that much of that was predicated on not only wanting change, but that change was motivated by compassion. Most yeah. of today's activism seems to be anger based. Can anger and outrage be a healthy and meaningful approach to affect change. You know, funny you should ask, because I also wrote, I wrote a different essay on spirituality and health about the uses of anger. And, um, and it, I, because I find myself being very angry at times, and I keep saying to myself, Phil, you've been on a spiritual path for over 50 years. You taught meditation. You teach people to be calm inside, to be loving and, you know, to develop through these methods. You wrote a whole book about it, and here you are being angry and, you know, essentially, you know, yelling at the television when the news <laughs> tells you certain things. And then I realized, you know, that anger, um, in and of itself is is neither a bad thing nor a good thing it's what what do you do when you're when that anger hits you when when you know john lewis whose death we are mourning as as we're recording this interview was angry martin luther king was angry gandhi was angry the american founders were angry at the brits but they channeled that. They didn't just lash out. That initial anger was toned and modified and transformed individually and collectively uh, for the people involved in uh, Gandhi's independent movement, independence movement, for people in the civil rights movement, the people who were doing nonviolent protests. They converted the anger into, you know, what we might consider uh, indignation or outrage, something controllable, something that could be channeled into a uh, compassionate, loving response to changing things, to solving uh, serious problems without the lashing out that uh, if you don't transform the anger just makes things worse so right now we're seeing this situation in portland oregon and you know the overwhelming majority of people protesting are angry but they're converting that anger into peaceful and creative forms of protest and the few people who can't do that or don't want to do that are making things worse by, you know, lashing out. And the response to it by the uh, administration and sending in troops is, a, you know, another way that anger is not being, ch you know, channeled in a constructive way. So to me, anger is, is a driver. It's a force. It's, a, it's, it's like a physiological response to something. But, it, you know, it, 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 we all know the, the, uh, the harm it, it does just, you know, even if you, you know, you're, you get angry at your, at your child and, and to say or do something you shouldn't. But on a societal level, it's really dangerous, but it can be channeled into a constructive, loving movement or action on an individual's basis. There's a lot of stuff about that in my book, actually. 
Yes. In your book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, you paraphrase Bob Dylan by saying, the times, <laughs> they are a crazy. How should those grounded in spiritual practice view these times? Well, they're crazy and they're <laughs> unprecedented. But as, as one of the people, I have a lot of endorsements for the book that um, I, I cherish because they're from uh, people I, I greatly respect. And one of them said, the times are crazy, but you don't have to be. And I thought I should have used that in the book myself <laughs> because, you know, we can remain sane. We, you know, the, the, all the spiritual practices, all the methods that I marshal in the book, you know, are designed to bring you to the, you know, place within us of, that's at peace and, and is wise and is conscious and compassionate and loving. We can retain some of that. The Bhagavad Gita, which is a, you know, sacred text I always return to, has a passage about the wise being having equanimity, you know, that inner contentment in the midst of gain or loss, uh, victory or defeat, pleasure or pain. And that equanimity can be cultivated uh, despite what's going on around us. And that not only protects us, it's a form of self-protection and refuge, but it's also a platform for us to then engage the crazy world, and in our own way, however limited, making it a little bit more sane. You know, as the Jew, the Jew, uh, the Jewish tradition has this uh, thing called tikkun olam, which is to to uh, heal a piece of the broken world. Yes. And uh, and we can all do that, well, even if it's just, you know, being kinder to our neighbors in the midst of this pandemic, even if it means helping somebody who, who uh, is destitute or, uh, you know, getting out the vote or whatever it may be, just being a better parent, you know, at a time when, you know, kids may be home from school. All these things matter. And the more we have inner peace and access to our own inner source of wisdom, the better we can do it. Staying spiritually sane in the midst of madness. Yes. Well put. Which is actually from your book. So. <laughs> yes, thank you. But I, I thought it might be a direct quote, but I, didn't, I wanted to give you credit. <laughs> no, no, thank you. No, but but the, you can give me credit for sharing the same concept with you. I have the same feeling and the same idea. Many with spiritual practice are used to gathering with their respective communities, sanghas, churches, temples, or sanctuaries. With physical distancing, some have found this community online, but many have not. How may we look within to find that special place? Well, there's. I'm a big advocate of uh, personal spiritual practice on a regular basis, um, and I advocate this not as a you know a, a form of religion. Although if it is for you, that's great. But you know, even for secular people, the methods that the spiritual traditions have come up with have, can be understood in a secular way. In a practical way, these are practical interventions for self-improvement, for cultivating the, the, the qualities of inner peace and higher, higher consciousness that have been very well documented in scientific research. So whether you're religious or you're an atheist, whether you're spiritual or secular, these kinds of methods, especially meditation, have a proven value. And I strongly advocate, uh, as I do in the early chapters, finding methods that work for you. Uh, there's instructions in the book. There's guidelines for looking outside of the, you know, what a book can provide. Um, and, and finding a routine that works for you in your life. This is, to me, a, a central issue. And, and then there's methods to add and so forth and to use at other times of the day. And we're going to discuss some of those practices in the next segment. My guest is Philip Goldberg, is the author of Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. We'll be back with more Phil after these words on the Olden Times Radio Network.
Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hi, this is David Strickle. I'm excited to share my brand new show, The Stream of David Live, right here on Ohm Times Radio. Each week, I'll have exciting guests, and I'll channel the eternal wisdom of the stream, a group of non-physical entities whose teachings have transformed lives all over the world. So join us for an uplifting hour each Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. That's The Stream of David Live, right here on Ohm Times Radio. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book, take a walk, unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September, paint a self-portrait, catch up on a TV series, do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hi, everyone. Al Roker here. As a guy with his own catchphrase, I appreciate that after 75 years... Smokey's only said, Only you can prevent wildfires. But I'm filling in because there's a lot more to report. Like when it's dry or windy. Be careful burning yard waste, because wildfires can even start in your neck of the woods. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. On Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Philip Goldberg, is the author of the brand new book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, Powerful Tools to Cultivate, Calm, Clarify, and Courage. Phil, you suggest that we create an inventory of practices to get us through these troubled times. What should we include in that inventory? Well, as I said in the last segment, um, I advocate having a, a, a consistent spiritual practice that works for you or practices that you could do you do on a routine daily basis uh, as routine as you as you take a shower or or brush your teeth or do you know exercise and, and all that it's ongoing uh, spiritual maintenance or mind body maintenance um, in addition I advocate that people do uh, to whatever degree of formality is comfortable for them uh, essentially, what I realized I had done over the years, but never did it uh, as a formal practice. I just I had accumulated methods that uh, I can turn to at any time as needed to return to that inner core of peace and stability and and find uh, a, a refuge from whatever's going on or to lift my spirit. And I realized I do this, these things, and so I advocate that people uh, create an inventory 
Um, and I, I, I suggest breaking it down into time segments from small periods of time, like less than five minutes, or if you want, even less than two or three minutes to five minutes. And then, you know, up to 15 minutes or up to a half hour or half hour to an hour and longer periods, including things you, you might do uh, for a whole day or a week or a month. Uh, those are obviously, uh, there are fewer things in that category, like going on retreat, taking a, you know, long uh, weighted vacation. But the in the shorter time frames, it could be anything from uh, certain breathing practices that, you know, could take just a few seconds or a minute. Uh, or physical exercises like the ones from the yoga tradition that, you know, stuff is happening. You just need to regain your center. You just do these things. It, can, it could take, just, you know, a minute or two. Uh, it, it could mean shutting off your uh, devices and just closing your eyes and doing a guided meditation, putting a guided meditation on, on a tape, or just listening to, you know, a, a really truly uplifting song, or going, you know, taking a walk around the block or in a nearby park, or prayer, if, if you're inclined toward prayer. These things don't take long. And if you have an inventory of them in written form, when the moment comes and you say, I, 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 I'm rattled, I'm agitated, I'm upset, uh, what can I do here to regain my center? Um, after a while, you don't need to consult the written documents. You could just, you'll know, you'll intuit what to do, and you'll have it at your fingertips. So I, I mean, there's a vast repertoire to choose from. And so I, I have guidelines in the book for creating such an inventory. Is inner peace only a breath away? It is. Uh, you're quoting me again. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes. And, and the reason I say that is because one of the more uh, immediate and effective ways to retain or regain a sense of inner peace, just to calm the, the agitation, um, is deep breaths. Um, and there's, you know, the yoga tradition has hundreds and hundreds of exercises uh, for doing this. And I, I have a few simple ones in the book. But even just pausing and taking a deep breath, especially a, a, an abdominal breath where, where you extend the abdomen so your lungs fill more completely. And then on the exhale, to exhale about 50% longer than the inhale. That's an added benefit of a deep breath uh, for which is a great deal of research. I, I explain the physiology of it in the book, but it's quite simple, actually. It, 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 it affects the nervous system in a very positive way to expel more of the carbon dioxide uh, than you might normally do. And then again, you know, deep breaths. And you just doing this, it could take takes less than a minute, and it has a, it can have tremendous benefit. And of course, there's also practices, breathing practices that you can do for a longer period of time uh, that are you know even more effective. What practices should we use? What do you recommend before and after meditation? Well, I'm I'm a big advocate of uh, the the. Uh, breathing methods that have been developed in the yoga tradition called pranayama and the uh, the physical stretches and bends that we associate with yoga, the asana, the postures. Um, and the, you don't have to be, you know, a big yogi to do these things. Um, you just have to learn a few stretches and bends that are comfortable for you. I also uh, have instructions for progressive relaxation for, for those who find, you know, it difficult to get up and stretch and bend. There's a, there are methods for tensing and relaxing the muscles. Doing this and some breathing before meditation uh, is, are good for uh, settling the body and mind more so you have a deeper meditation. There, some people like to have a prayer before they meditate or an invocation of some kind, 
perhaps a, a chant or a song. Um, and these are also effective. Those can also be done after meditation. Um, so people have different routines that suit uh, their needs and their spiritual orientations. In spiritual practice for crazy times, you say that we should practice the spiritual two-step and help the world from the inside out. Please teach us this dance. This I alluded to it earlier, this sanctuary of peace and a fortress of strength within us is not only a refuge, it's a foundation for acting more effectively in the world. And in normal times, it just might mean, you know, because you have, uh, you turn within each day and do spiritual practices uh, as needed, you you come out and you're, you know, a better parent, you're, you're a better uh, professional, whatever you do, you're a better nurse, you're a better doctor, you're a better bus driver, uh, you know, whatever. And these are proven methods that, you know, scientific research has verified as having those effects. So I call it a spiritual two-step. You turn within and uh, bring out those inner qualities and then engage the world and take your responsibilities as a citizen, as a family member, as a professional, as a you know member of an occupation, and do it with more integrity, with more compassion, with more skill. There's a term in the uh, in Sanskrit called upaya, which means skillful means. And everything we do should be done with skillful means so that we do it more effectively and have a better impact on the world. And the world improves through these small gestures that each of us does, each of us do on, on, on our own, uh, in our own lives. Uh, that influence spreads. You're kinder to somebody you run into. They'll in turn feel better and be kinder to someone else. Uh, you're more uh, compassionate, you're more tuned in if you're politically oriented or you're involved in wanting to make the uh, social justice uh, movement uh, more effective. Whatever it is you do, you'll do it more effectively and with the uh, you know, spiritual qualities that we all value of love and compassion and wisdom. And so that's why I call it a spiritual two-step. Uh, for too many uh, years and in too many uh, people's lives, being spiritual often means escaping the world and disengaging. And I think that's a misconception, and it's not what is called for in these times. We need engaged spiritual people who uh, can help make the world uh, a little saner. You also offer some immediate interventions we can employ when crises erupt. Can you give a couple of them to us now? Yeah, well, we've talked about breathing. Um, and some one immediate thing anybody can do in those moments is engage the senses. You're rattled, uh, and uh, you, you can't just leave the situation and go meditate or, you know, pray or go to a uh, church or a park, but you can, even inconspicuously, take a deep breath, you can touch something. The sense of touch, or even and even the other senses, but sense of touch is easier and, and somehow more immediate. And put your attention on that, on that in, in, in the moment, sensory experience, touching the chair, touching your knee, Putting your hand in your pocket. Some people carry an amulet or uh, something, you know, sacred uh, or sentimental, like a stone from their honeymoon or something. And and just feeling that in your hand brings you back to your center quickly, even if it's just temporary. But it's it's a moment of centering. And there's many other things we can do as well. What would you like your readers to take away from spiritual practice for crazy times? The commitment to uh, creating uh, a deeper uh, spiritual routine for themselves, to deepen the practices they already engage in, to expand their repertoire so they uh, 
broaden their spiritual basis and and deepen it and to remember that there is an inner sanctuary within ourselves and that is should be our first stop it's you know to invoke uh, the, the uh, jesus uh, seek ye first the kingdom of god and in the yoga tradition it's establish yourself in yoga and then perform action so to remember that your spiritual foundation within you is a high priority and should be a matter of routine and that that will make you a better parent, spouse, professional, whatever as well. My guest, Philip Goldberg, his new book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. Phil, please share with our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and all of this wonderful work. Uh, wherever books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the online places that you uh, are limited to now in the absence of bookstores. <laughs> when bookstores open again, you, it should be there. And you can find me at philipgoldberg.com or, or my podcast, spiritmatterstalk.com. And um, I hope you'll, you'll stay in touch. And, and I'm offering a free uh, guided meditation uh, instruction for people who buy the book. And uh, you'll find uh, instructions for that on my website. Phil, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this valuable information for those who are listening. Thank you, Victor, for the great conversation. I appreciate it. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. <laughs> 